um, spotted, the spotted lantern fly that will be presented by California Department of Food and Agriculture and USDA. We have a lot of guests on the call today, and I do want to let them know that this is uh, an official meeting of the Nursery Advisory Board, who advises the secretary on um, issues affecting the nursery industry. And so there's a few things that we need to do to be in compliance. So I'm going to go through uh, these, these housekeeping things, and then we'll do introductions. So the meetings of the Nursery Advisory Board are open to the public and comply with the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act. This act allows for public comment on all agenda items. Audience members may address the board following each agenda item. All participants from the audience are limited to three minutes. Are there any members of the audience that require accommodation in order to participate in this meeting? If so, please use the raise chat feature on the Zoom meeting or you can send a message to nursery services at cdfa.ca.gov if you require accommodation. Seeing no hand raise on the chat. All right, we'll go into roll call. Um, please, I'm going to call out the names of the board members. Please speak loudly when I call your name because this is being recorded and we want to make sure that we can hear that you're here. David Cox. Present. John Dillon. Michael France. Present. Justin Hooper. Bruce Jensen. Present. Jay Jensen, Thomas Lucas, and Dan Waterhouse. Dan, can you unmute? There you go. And Dan Waterhouse, you're here. Okay, I can see his name there, so I know he's here. We'll mark you as present. And then Janet Kister, I'm here. All right, we're going to go through the guest. I'll call out the non-voting attendees of the Nursery Advisory Board. And then after that, um, any of the other guests or attendees who'd like to identify themselves, please let us know. It's not mandatory for you to identify yourself, but it will help us to know that you're on. Um, first, the non-voting attendees. Ha Dang. Good morning. Here. Good morning. Sandy Ellis. Lauren Oki. Present. Good morning. Good morning. Karen Suslow. And Chris Sanabini. Present. Great. So um, the other guests that are here, uh, why don't you please um, give us your name and what company or organization you're with and what city or county you're at. Kristen, you want to start? I saw you were on here. Sure. Um, this is Fred Tobias. I'm with First Step Greenhouses in Temecula, uh, from Riverside County. I'm on San Diego County Farm Bureau and uh, PCA. Uh, this is Kirsten Pullman. I'm here for the San Diego County Flower and Plant Association. Dana? Dana Groot, Floribunda Nursery, Encinitas, California, uh, Farm Bureau uh, Board of Directors. Katie, you want to sure. introduce Katie yourself? With the California Farm Bureau up here in Sacramento. Anyone else? Yes, this is Lisa Herbert, Sutter County Agricultural Commissioner. Hello, good morning. This is Danny Daly with the Agricultural Council of California. Good morning, this is Brad. I'm with um, the Pinery. Have we missed anyone? Dante Gonzalez, Addy Verde Growers. Jan Hall, Target Specialty Products. 
Dan Waterhouse finally got my audio working. <laughs> Dan. All right, hearing no one else. Um, throughout this meeting, we're gonna ask that all speakers identify themselves for the minutes and to help make sure that we maintain clear communication. Uh, there were no documents that were shared for this meeting, but is anyone having trouble viewing the webinar? You can see the agenda up on the screen at this point. Please take a look at the agenda and request um, asking if there are any questions or corrections to it. All right, this meeting is expected to be about an hour, and because of that, Excuse we will me, have no Jana, breaks. I don't yes? see the I don't see the agenda. Ah. Sorry, neither do I. Okay, so you may want to ch change your view. Okay, the agenda just went away. Um, yeah. There it, okay. there it is. How about now? Yes. Okay. Yes. I got it. Thank you. I, I reshared because if they came on later, they may not be able to see it. So I did reshare. Perfect. Okay. Any corrections or additions to the agenda? All right. Um, so this is gonna be a short meeting, so there'll be no breaks. We will have questions at the end. And I do request that everyone keep themselves muted throughout the presentation so for a background uh, noise. All right, so we are gonna start with Mark McLaughlin. I'd like to introduce him. He is the new director of Plant Health and Pest Prevention Services Division for uh, CDFA. Mark, if you can take it from here. Sure, thank you for the invite and I appreciate the attendance here today. It looks like everybody has strong relationships here, known everybody for a while, which is a good thing. We have a lot of um, partners here today, our federal partners of APHIS, and uh, our own CDFA experts, and I want to introduce the spotted lanternfly um, issue that we have in California. The CDFA hasn't planned for a, a pest like this in its history, and in the last two years, uh, Dr. Andy Klein has led a strategic planning group, and then also Kyle Buki, our primary state entomologist, has been setting up a science advisory panel, and then we've also had close coordination with APHIS back east, and National Policy Manager Aaron Otto, as we go through, um, we'll do a presentation uh, first with APHIS and what's going on back east with um, Spotted Lanternfly. And then we'll go through what we're doing here in California uh, for this pest. Um, lots of coordination, lots of coordination, recent coordination with um, our state partners, also CALSTA, our transportation agency, uh, BNSF Railroad, others as we go through. So anyway, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to to your attention as a beginning conversation for Spotted Lanternfly and how it affects uh, your industry. With that, uh, we can start with Erin. Hi, good morning, everyone. I am going to start sharing my screen here. Share, and then my PowerPoint, which I'm gonna go into presentation mode. Okay, is it in presentation mode? Yes, you're good. Awesome. All right, so um, welcome everyone. Um, I'm gonna be giving a update today uh, on the Spider Lantern Fly program. It is a cooperative program between uh, U a USDA APHIS um, and the state's departments of agriculture. So I'm gonna give you a little bit about the history of the program, uh, biology, and I'm also gonna give a little bit of the operational update. Um, so the Spider Lanternfly Cross-Functional Working Group, uh, this is a group of USDA APHIS uh, plant protection and quarantine employees. And we're kind of the, the core of the group that's working on Spider Lanternfly. So my name is Erin Otto and I am the national policy manager for Spotter Lanternfly. Um, and my job is to manage uh, policy um, and relationships related to Spotter and Lanternfly. Also, whoops, attending today is Matt Travis. Um, and he is the multi-state coordinator for Spotter Lanternfly. 
He is uh, the field ops arm of the cross-functional working group, um, and he is in close coordination with both the state plant health directors on the PPQ side and the state plant regulatory officials um, on the state side. And then lastly, we have Greg Para. He is uh, the staff scientist that is on our cross-functional working group. And he is with the science and technology portion of plant protection and um, quarantine. And he's actually been from on the program from the beginning. So Greg has a lot of institutional knowledge about um, of spot and lanternfly um, in the past several years. So we're kind of your go-to contacts um, in USDA for spot and lanternfly. So today I'm gonna to go over a little bit of the background of spot or lantern fly, cover a little bit of the biology. We'll go over the current population areas um, and I'll have a nice little blob map for you. Um, I will cover the fiscal year 21 program goals for the cooperative uh, program. And then also cover some of the program activities that we've done in fiscal year 21 that have also carried into fiscal year um, tw or 20, it also carried into fiscal year 21. So let me go into a little bit of the background of the pest. So spotted lanternfly um, was first detected in Berks County, Pennsylvania in 2014. Um, and it was a small population that was discovered in Southeastern Pennsylvania. But in that sort of six or seven years since then, the population has ex expanded to uh, 10 other states. So the population area has increased through national, natural spread but, but in some of the cases, uh, human assisted spread. Um, and that is now 10 now, I'm sorry, I didn't change that, that is my bad. Um, and those additional states are um, Connecticut, Delaware, Maryland, New Jersey, New York, Virginia, West Virginia, and then heading west, uh, we have small populations in Ohio um, on the very Eastern portion of the state, and then also we have one satellite population in Switzerland County, in Indiana, which is um, right along the, the Ohio uh, River um, in the south section of the state. Um, as you may know, the highly preferred host of spot or lanternfly, this exotic pest, is also an exotic tree, um, and that is Tree of he Heaven, Alanthus altissima. So this pest ad adversely affects grapes and hops and fruit trees and ornamental trees. Um, and it could be a potential threat to forest ecosystems. Um, thus far, what we have seen is that vineyards are the most uh, adversely affected agricultural commodity um, with some farmers experiencing uh, significant losses um, and other growers have decided to not expand their their grape growing operations out of fear of future crop loss. Um, all the affected vineyard owners have experienced increased labor and pesticide costs associated with SLF control. Um, and it's also uh, sort of looked at as a nuisance pest um, because Tree of Heaven is not just in natural areas, but it is often, uh, it often grows in disturbed areas. So if you think of, you know, right of ways for any sort of transportation. You think of vacant lots anywhere in the urban, suburban sort of ecosystem where we have disturbed uh, ground. That's where tree of heaven likes to flourish. Um, and so this is a pest that affects not only agriculture, but it's a, it's a broad um, pest because tree of heaven is, is kind of one of those insidious trees that grows in a lot of places. Um, what we know is that we have, at this time, no natural enemies are known in the United States. So the program uh, treatment efforts have focused on chemical treatment. Um, beginning in 2016, the primary method of control uh, was the manual removal of egg masses and the chemical and mechanical removal of, of Tree of Heaven, and then also the application of pesticides. Um, and what we started out with was dinotefron as a systemic bark application on Tree of Heaven to create something that we call trap trees. And I'll talk a little bit about that later in the presentation. In 2022, uh, the program began to use contact knockdown insecticides 
applied by broadcast spray applications. And then we've also started using golden pest spray oil as an ovicide for SLF egg masses. So let's talk a little bit about um, the growth. And here I have the growth map and what we like to refer to lovingly as the blob map. Um, this kind of shows you the infestation areas of from the last four years. So here we have the infestation area in blue in the center and that's 2018. And you can see that it was pretty much still um, uh, contained in that southeastern area of Pennsylvania. But as the years go with human uh, assisted spread, not only um, with the, the uh, natural spread, it spreads out from the center. And so we have a little bit more and that's 2019 in green where it goes a little westward in Pennsylvania and we start to see it in New Jersey significantly. And then it starts to uh, go down into Delaware and Maryland. And then we had that, uh, that pocket down in Winchester, Virginia. Uh, in 2020, last year, it started to spread north a little bit, uh, more of New Jersey here into southern New York. Um, and we're also seeing along that rail corridor out west in Pennsylvania. That's what that little snake-like sliver is. Um, so that is associated with rail. Um, you may see that, notice that little um, sliver that goes down through uh, Virginia down towards uh, Winchester, Virginia, and down towards the Shenandoah Valley. Um, that is also associated with rail, but it is also a major uh, transportation corridor, um, Interstate 81, which is a, a major north-south corridor in the eastern United States. That is in that valley as well. As, and so um, this is some of our concerns about, uh, about high-risk pathways. Um, as it spreads. Um, this year, you'll notice, I don't have Indiana on the map here, the map couldn't be bigger, but that is also thought to be a uh, human assisted uh, movement. And that is, that would be like way out here. Oh, you can't see my, my pointer. Oops, anyway. So that's kind of what we're dealing with so far. And so our goal is to keep it in the mid-Atlantic states, not to move to major grape growing areas, not to move um, through human assisted, uh, human assisted movement, uh, long stretches. Uh, we're trying to just keep it contained in this area to re reduce the effects on US agriculture. And um, floriculture. So um, for fiscal year 21, uh, we over the winter, we thought really hard about our program goals and um, with our cooperators have developed these program goals for this cooperative program. Um, and so we have six of them. The first is we're going to focus primary control measures based on data and that identifies the key areas and established populations. So we're gonna be treating in those those key areas with the established populations. And we're gonna to try to um, knock some of those established populations down. We're gonna focus primary control measures on high risk transportation and commodity pathways to minimize that long distance dis dispersal that I was just talking about. We're going to rapidly respond to SLF, SLF satellite populations as they are discovered. And that's what we're currently doing in Ohio and Indiana and uh, those, those areas that are not contingent with the core area. And we're gonna promote the development, harmonization and implementation of best management practices for all sorts of industries and businesses, as well as uh, agricultural growers. Uh, we're also gonna promote the harmonization of state SLF regulatory and data collection activities across the SLF program. Uh, data collection is, is very important in understanding uh, what is happening with the program and how efficacious treatments are and kind of getting an idea of how uh, the population uh, dynamics work from year to year. And then also we're gonna maximize SLF education, management recommendations and citizen reporting by supporting robust outreach strategy. So at the national level, we have a, a national outreach 
And then each of our program states have developed um, individual uh, targeted outreach based on their specific uh, industries and, and their uh, specific needs. So one main area program of focus is these high risk pathways. And those pathways include rail and transit pathways. They include high volume shipping operations and cooperators. So if you think of the Amazons of the world, um, UPS, FedEx, those sorts of things, um, and Walmart, big box stores, um, high risk industries. So those would be industries um, that would move, uh, that could possibly move egg masses and things like that. Uh, you might think of uh, Christmas tree industries. You might think of um, anything that moves maybe, you know, stone that's been outside for a while um, and, and your general agricultural commodities um, uh, as well. So those are all the things we're targeting to stop the movement of SLF. One thing that, uh, one of the pathways that has been of importance to California is air cargo. So I'm gonna highlight air cargo as one of the pathways. Um, and this year um, we have been able to, uh, to cooperate with the Japanese Beetle program to gain some data support. Um, this year we developed new uh, data fields in the uh, Survey123 app used by Japanese Beetle inspectors. And so if you may not know, the Japanese Beetle program Program. There are departure airports and there are arriving airports. And at both airports, there are inspectors that inspect planes for Japanese Beetle. Um, we have been able to build in some SLF fields in those uh, data collectors so that those inspectors at the same time they're looking for Japanese Beetle can also look for spot and lanternfly. And we can get better data and better understand this pathway. Um, so last year we've had some dead uh, spot and lantern fly. This year we've had dead spot and lantern fly on flights. And so that uh, data will help us better understand the pathway and make better recommendations and mitigations in place. We're also working with our science and technology brands and the US Air Force to develop treatments for departure flights to the West Coast. Um, we've been uh, doing a study this summer with Dover Air Force Base or at Dover Air Force Base with the U.S. Air Force to test treatments um, that could be used on uh, on aircraft. Um, so hopefully that will lead us to some some very good treatments that we can use. Um, and we've also been partnering with the Air Force, um, providing outreach to them um, since there's a lot of um, movement of military uh, equipment and uh, aircraft around the country. Some of our major activities in the spotter lantern fly program are detection and survey activities. Um, still the primary and best surveillance tactic for SLF is visual survey, Just going out there and looking for it. Um, we also have developed circle traps. Um, and that's in the picture you see there. Um, those are deployed um, in program states um, and as part of other uh, different state um, surveillance programs. Um, basically this trap takes advantage of the uh, behavior of spider and lanternfly. Spider and lanternfly likes to crawl to the top of the vegetation or whatever it's crawling up and then launch itself off. So by putting this circle trap around trees, they get funneled up into this little bag or container and die there. And then that's where we can um, go ahead and uh, grab them and count them and, and what have you. Um, we also use sentinel trees and those would be trees that we with uh, Dynatefron uh, as a bark basal spray. And then we lay mats underneath them and uh, count how many dead spider and lanternfly, how many spider and lanternfly feed on, feed on the tree and then fall off dead below. And then our last uh, 
where type of surveillance is is public reporting. Last but not least, it's very um, it's been very helpful. Public reporting has has really been the key to finding satellite populations in areas that are not contingent with the main air uh, main infested area. So we rely heavily on public reporting, and we do a lot of outreach because of it. Um, so that is, we're always in the development of new survey tools. We also have a bug barrier, which is a sticky band with a barrier, plastic barrier on the outside to reduce bycatch. That has also been employed with the program. So some of the treatments that we have been using in the program, um, here we have in the top picture, someone uh, doing a direct or foliar application to a tree. So they're either creating a sentinel tree for, um, for survey or they're doing a trap tree <coughs> for treatment. Um, a trap tree just doesn't have the data collection involved in it. Um, so what this does is a systemic long lasting uh, insecticide that is sprayed on the trunk of the tree. It's that insecticide is translocated up into the tree and it, um, the spider lantern fly feed on the tree and then die. So we've been doing a lot of trap tree um, treatments around airports, maritime ports, commercial industrial sites, transportation corridors, and rail properties. In fiscal year 20, we've started to get into the broadcast, broadcast spray arena, applying contact insecticides. And for the most part, we've been using bifenthrin. Um, that's been with manual pump backspack sprayers or spray rigs using hydraulic guns. And we focus that on rail pro uh, properties and high priority areas um, as a knockdown treatment. Um, we are working to get a revised environmental assessment going so that we can use uh, mist uh, applications, mist blowing applications um, along rail in Pennsylvania and also a certain counties in Ohio as it, that rail spur goes west uh, and West Virginia, and then also south through West Virginia, Maryland, and Virginia along that rail spur down towards the Shenandoah Valley. So fingers crossed, we'll be able to use that along rail properties and uh, rail intermodal sites um, maybe next year. There's a lot of research going on in the SLF world and it has been um, since the start of the program. Um, there are very specific strategic areas of research for spotter and lanternfly and those include uh, survey and trapping. So we're always trying to refine, uh, give me a second. Um, you know what? Okay, I'm just gonna keep going. Um, Research activities, um, so surveying and trapping, we're always trying to get uh, better trapping tools, better surveying tool, tools. Um, so, you know, looking at volatile research um, and then also with some detector dog uh, research we've been doing, we, we've been able to successfully deploy some canines. Um, treatments, always looking for treatments. This is going to be a pest that is not, there's not gonna be one silver bullet for it. Um, we're gonna need, everyone's uh, strengths and by everyone, public, uh, academia, um, uh, federal and state and industry to, to work on this pest, um, to contain it and uh, to eradicate those satellite populations. So there's not gonna be one treatment, not one magic bullet. And so we're always working on that. Um, we're also, also doing research on the biology and rearing. This insect has been very difficult to work with. It's been difficult to, um, to rear colonies and keep them alive. Um, in a lot of cases with a lot of other insects, you know, with fruit flies, you can keep, you know, continual colonies going and, and do continual research. This in insect is one, um, is, is one generation a year and it doesn't really do well um, in captivity. And so it's been very difficult to rear and maintain a colony. Um, we've been able to just rear them from egg masses and usually we get the one colony and they don't survive to create a new colony. So we're still working on that. 
Uh, there's a lot of work being done in academia as well as um, the USDA on pathway and predictive modeling. And then lastly, we have biological control. Um, we have looked at classical biological control. We have a couple of possible um, parasitoids that are working through the system to see if they could be viable um, as biological control agents. Uh, and then also uh, there has been work on a verticillium wilt that could help biologically control tree of heaven and then um, some fungi that might be a possibility to reduce populations um, as well. So what are our next steps? What's, what's on the horizon for SLF? What's the future? Well, I did mention the canines. Um, we have a canine project going with, uh, within the USDA um, the use of canines for, uh, uh, for egg mass detection has been um, shown successful. Um, so we've been able to work with states um, and certain states, including Pennsylvania, have canines. Uh, Pennsylvania has, the luck, has Lucky, who has been trained to be able to sniff out SLF uh, egg masses and has been used on uh, sort of blitzes on transportation pathways and things like that. Uh, New York has um, some New York, I think they're, I can't remember which portion of, off the top of my head, um, but New York and New Jersey, their trail associations have used canines to help uh, sniff out egg masses. And then we're hoping to deploy uh, a, a canine in North Carolina a K-19 team in North Carolina to help with detection. So it's a multi-state regional approach. Um, we're, also also, we're also always looking for alternatives to current pesticides um, that we have, especially when dealing with maritime and air cargo. The current suite of pesticides that we have, um, there are some limitations um, within using them within Air, airplanes and then also around water. So we're always looking for new pesticides. And then further development of environmental documentation, environmental assessments. Um, currently we have, we're working on that. And then new revisions to the PPQ SLF website and outreach material. Um, our federal home for the outreach material for SLF is the Hungry Pest website. Um, so you just have to go to Hungry Pests and look for the SLF website. Um, we also have our, the program website that we'll be continuing to add updates to. And then resource, uh, we're gonna also do, focus on research to inform management recommendations for green industries. The more we, you know, as the saying goes, uh, when you know better, when you know more, you do better. Um, and so that's what we're always seeking for in the spotter lantern fly program is to expand our knowledge so that we can come up with real world uh, management recommendations for uh, green industries and other industries and, and along high risk pathways. So that's where we're headed with SLF. So I think I've talked long enough. <laughs> Are there any questions? Yes, this is David Cox. Do you have any idea of the, the range of this pest as far as environmental concerns? Like where will it, what's, it, what's its temperature limits, humidity and all that? Yeah, so there's been a lot of modeling done. Um, there's been phenological models. There's been uh, a lot of models produced, not only by USDA, but by Temple University um, and um, some other entities. You want me to chime in? Yes, please. Yeah, so so there was a pretty recent study by uh, uh, somebody named Wacky, Wakey, um, and others, and they used a niche modeling algorithm called maximum entropy or max n, as it's usually referred to, uh, to model the potential distribution of spotted lantern fly in the United States. And uh, one of the caveats of that is they used the current distribution uh, data points to, you know, to kind of produce that model. And, you know, of course we know that this thing is uh, presently spreading, so it hasn't yet reached its 
maximum you know potential distribution um uh, so uh but with that caveat in mind they they did use uh these bioclimatic variables and and those are things like uh, you know uh, maximum precipitation of the warmest quarter you know things like that and and they did predict that uh, spotted lanternfly was likely to be able to establish uh, you know in coastal and uh, central valley of california and uh, and i think in a lot of other parts of the united states and presumably i can't recall off the top of my head but yeah if you went really far north like into canada you may be getting too cold and uh, and then i'll just remind you that the uh, present distribution is basically limited to temperate climate so we have korea um, parts of china and then the northeastern united states so this is not uh, what you'd call a tropical insect. Um, Does that answer your question, David? Pretty much. I was just wondering what it would do when it hit the, the high temperatures of the San Joaquin Valley with very low humidity. But sounds no, that, like it yeah, it, go. It, what we know, all we know is that we it, it's not found anywhere like that now, but we have no reason to expect that it's had an opportunity. So. Um, yeah, we just have to continue to analyze the data, you know, as it spreads. And uh, maybe there's experiments and labs that have been done with that. I'm not sure about that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, this is uh, Greg Parra. Yeah, some of the research that's ongoing, a lot of it's with Melody Keenan, but of course it's under controlled conditions in growth chambers where she's simulating different temperature regimes to see what it would do. And holding it, you know, at some constant high, constant low temperatures, and then also doing what she calls like a cold shock or heat wave effect, where it's being held and then expose it for a certain length of time to really high temperatures or really low temperatures to see what what would happen. So we're getting some interesting results on on that work. This is Dana Groot. Um, it seems like. Um, it's unlikely that uh, large numbers of sterile flies can be reared in the absence of a natural enemy. I'll just say that uh, I don't know of a single example where uh, sterile insects have been used for control of an insect in this order. You know, all of the things that I'm aware of are, you know, uh, Lepidoptera, uh, flies, things like that. I, I don't know of any instance where sterile releases have been made for um, Emeptra, but someone else might be able to comment on that better than I. Yeah, we probably should, uh, sorry, sometimes we do that at the beginning of some of our presentations. This is Greg again too, but just to let other people know, even though the way it's mounted and the way it looks, some people think it's a moth or a, uh, yeah, they'll assume it's a moth or because of the name, it's a fly, but yes, it's a, it's a hopper. So, so it's yeah. not a fly, it's, it's Hemipterus? Okay. Yeah, of course, the, like what, what uh, Aaron had pointed out too, I mean, the, the need to have like a, a continuous colony we, where we can produce large numbers. Right now, the colony is, uh, the work that's going on that, we can produce colonies and get them, you know, uh, through all the way to adults and egg laying and then have the egg patch and uh, try and keep them going. But of course, right now, I mean, it's a very intensive system and it's it just low yeah. numbers at this point. Yeah. So just to, you know, like in things like uh, flies, you know, think the way that those things are mass produced and sterilized, it's like a factory setting. I mean, you're breeding these things and in, you know, ma large masses of artificial medium, um, you, you know, you're handling the pupae like in mass. I mean, it's a very different situation. You don't have things crawling on live plants that have to be maintained and, you know, the numbers and the uh, output per year and the labor involved, all of those are like, uh, you know, multiplied by a great number to go from what we normally do for a sterile release to something like this. Yeah, it's just for something like a, uh, uh, fluid feeder. It's really challenging. So right now it's just it's definitely large intact tree of heaven that's used because they, they definitely have a, uh, seem like they have a high turgor pressure requirement to pump the fluid into them as they feed. And then they have really high feeding requirements as they continue to go all the way to adults. So you need something pretty significant to feed them with. Janet, you had a question? 
I did. I actually have two questions. So the first one is, you talked about targeting high-risk um, uh, pathways, um, including commodities. Can you give us some details on what you mean on targeting as it relates to nursery products? Sure. I'm going to chime in first, and then I um, maybe Matt can elaborate. Um, so we've been targeting um, for nursery products. Um, a lot of the the states have a permitting um, program where they go out and for um, for com uh, companies that may be moving material out of the uh, quarantine areas, um, they have to be aware of spot and lanternfly. They take a training about spot and lanternfly and its movement and its significance and and its life cycle, and um, and then they have to do uh, make sure inspect their product to make sure that it's spot or lantern fly free when it leaves their facility. Um, and let me ask Matt Travis, uh, can you elaborate a little bit about that? Sure, Aaron. Um, so they take the training um, and then once the training's complete, they have to, you know, they pass a test. There's a bit of a quiz, a test to test their knowledge. And then they, they gain a certificate, which then they're allowed to use to get their permit to move anything. And that's any business. It doesn't matter, it's plant material, non-plant material, that's any business coming out of those state quarantine counties. Um, and they are required to have that with them. Um, and so what, what uh, that was first instituted uh, by Pennsylvania, um, the permitting training itself is, is something that Penn State runs a lot for several states. And then what the adjacent states have done is they've done something very similar. And then they all are, are running compliance check stops um, to, to ensure that vehicles coming out of those quarantine counties are indeed carrying their permits and that they're knowledgeable and understanding of spotted lanternfly, the life stages and how they could potentially impact or, or carry spotted lanternfly uh, life stages, you know, out of their doing their normal business um, out of their county. Um, in ter terms of other activities, so with any uh, high-risk pathways, so any of the pathways Aaron talked about, rail or highways, truck traffic, uh, industry movements, again, there's a lot of emphasis put there. Some states have gone into uh, actually uh, putting in place compliance agreements with uh, industries that move high volumes of material out of the quarantine counties. Um, there are, you know, requirements, kind of self-certification requirements. There are uh, checkups uh, by state uh, agricultural inspectors done in some places. So th those, those safeguards have been, and measures have been put in place to mitigate the movement. Um, and then, and then, Academia, Penn State and the like have used extension, of course, to educate their nursery and green industries uh, on best management practices within the nurseries. So again, there's, there's nothing specific to the nurseries that spotted lanternfly is really focused on. Sure, there are things that are in its host range uh, that's, that's understood, but there's nothing that spotted lanternfly necessarily wants to go to in a nursery versus an ailanthus tree or some other place like a vineyard or orchard fruit, anything else. It's, it's really not, it's not something like that. Um, so in areas though, that they know they're moving high volumes of plant material, you know, they are, they are usually under compliance agreement. They are absolutely having to have a permit. And then, uh, you know, universities have used extension with best management practices in helping them treat or manage it chemically if that is required or necessary. A lot of that's been focused, however, on the outside of the nurseries where Alanthus may be present. Um, again, Alanthus being the preferred host is something that is being focused on to try and keep these populations from moving into the nurseries or moving on to uh, B and B nursery stock that may be moved um, out of that nursery. Yeah, I would just uh, add that once they flow into a nursery, once they're on the outside and they get in, it seems pretty consistent that they, the plants they do seem to like once they get into a nursery is Tyrex. That seems really consistent. 
so my other question is um, in reference to the tree of health, and you were talking about, I wrote a note, eliminating the tree of health, but I think you're trying to, to reduce the population. Do you have concerns that if you do that, that an established population will then move into other crops, like the grapes and the other things that you had listed? I, I think that is that is been a concern. Um, I, I think that um, for us, there's no way to, tree heaven is kind of everywhere. It, it's ubiquitous. It's insidu insidious. Um, I don't think there's any way, any state, even the, the feds, we could eliminate tree of heaven. It's just, it's just here. Um, so I think by reducing that tree of heaven in certain locations, like at rest stops, truck stops, uh, gas stations, ports of entry, um, it eliminates the, the immediate food source, preferred food source right there. So if something did happen to hitchhike, you know, and wind up in one of these high risk pathways, there's not as much there for it to cling to and to start a new population. So we've been doing targeted removals and targeted herbicide treatments. Um, but I, I don't think we need to worry about eliminating all of it. Because I, I just think, in my opinion, and this is my personal opinion, I think it's kind of impossible to eradicate tree of heaven in the U.S. It's just not going to happen. And I will okay, add that you. I will add that where we have eliminated Atlantis, I mean, we we have really focused, of course, on our rail yards, our ports of entry, our airports. Um, where Atlantis is in the periphery, along fence lines, in the disturbed areas Aaron talked about. And so in those cases, you know, eliminating that is eliminating the possibility of spotted lanternfly to, to be there. Um, and we really haven't seen it move away. Whereas if you don't move Atlantis, when we do chemical treatment, even knockdown sprays, what we have seen, as long as Atlantis is present, we see will knock down a population, we'll start to see migration of, of, a land, of spotted lanternfly from other areas back into those sites after we've knocked out the initial population. So we know that as long as Atlantis is there, it is something that tends to draw them and, and they, are, they are coming to those Atlantis, even if we're leaving, you know, even if we're uh, eradicating or eliminating the population present on site. If the adjacent populations are moving then back into those other sites. So again, we, we are still still kind of in also in some data collection there with Atlantis removal. We've had several states elect to eliminate Atlantis in their state parks or in high risk areas like Aaron talked about, uh, rest, uh, rest roads, uh, rest stops along roadways and things like that. And so we're kind of interested to see what the outcome will be when they have very controlled areas that they can eliminate, totally eliminate Atlantis in specific areas. We're very interested in, in collecting data and seeing how that impacts the population in that area. So, um, yeah. All right, any further questions for USDA before we move on to CDFA? Hey, Janet, Michael Franz here. I have one question. Just curious about the mobility of the pest on its own. I understand it's a hitchhiker, but does it have wings? Does it, is it moved by wind? Is it very mobile on its, under its own power? I'm going to let Greg uh, yeah, para. That's yeah, go ahead. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, yeah, you know, it goes through nymphal stages. I mean, it's just, it's a true bug. So, I mean, it, it molts like to each stage. So, the only one that's, that's mo that has wings can fly around is the adult stage. So it'll go through four instars, then get to the adult stage. The, in the first through fourth instars, uh, they move, but they don't tend to move great distances. And they tend to stay close to where their egg mass was at initially, and then they'll spread out. And their host selection, you know, it, the host that's found on increases, you know, at first instar, second and third, and it starts to narrow back down again like in the end of the third into the fourth and then into the adults, it narrows down pretty specifically. And then it'll go out again once it gets to, um, you know, past mating and it can begin egg laying. So at that stage, what we've seen 
initially when you have low populations, the, the spread, the movement does not seem to be that great, even at the adult stage, except, you know, with, of course, people moving it. But, uh, you know, as your population gets higher than that's when, um, and usually it takes a couple of years, but initially uh, most sites have, have, a, have a shot or have a chance when it first comes in. But then after it gets to a certain size population, then that's when you start having a more, more flight activity in the adult phase. And they tend to move out uh, a lot further. And it's not known if that's because of like reduction of the food resources they have, like the, the tree of heaven is getting like, lean or tapped out or else if it's just uh you know uh the population level gets to a point where it's like now they've decided like they need to disperse a little bit further so yeah there definitely seems to be different dynamics uh based around the population size and level yeah and because it's a hopper it it's it's not going to be a flyer so um the adults they tend to to climb up the highest thing out there and then sort of launch themselves out, off um i think I think some of the research said it was 200 feet that can, they can go. Um, but so they're not going to be like flying miles and miles and miles. It's going to be a uh, long distance movement is going to be uh, almost entirely um, uh, human assisted. Yeah, yeah. What about with like wind currents and stuff? I mean, I would imagine that if you had a thermal and some of these, you know, the flight uh, activity can be a little bit unpredictable. I've seen some papers suggesting that, on occasion, they can get pretty high, and then I would expect that 200 feet would be on the smaller end of, of some of those. <laughs> yeah, but it's not going to be going miles and miles. I mean, it's going to be launching itself and maybe gliding on the air currents or or hopping away. It's not going to be it's not going to be like a a, a a maybe a hymenoptera type situation where they can they can fly miles and miles. They're going to be fairly localized. And in those instances, they're fairly, I mean, they're, they're very unique and very specific when that happens. It's not like the, the, like the majority or like a large proportion of the population is, has been observed doing that, like being carried off like that. But yeah, there have been high numbers observed in those areas that get, get up sometimes in those places with their thermals where they can get carried. But they, in general, they're not strong flyers. And usually they, what they're flying to is they're just trying to find, you know, their next food source. And they seem like they're happy once they land, if they find something good they can feed on. They're not continuously flying and finding food and flying and finding food. It seems like they, they're they happy if they find something that uh, suits them. Great, thank you. <clears throat> so not to cut off questions, but let's move on to CDFA because they may answer some of the questions that people have and then we'll have time after that presentation for more questions. So uh, David, are you going next? Yep. Hi, Mark, do you wanna say an uh, introduction real quick? Um, I pre thanks for the presentation, Aaron, and others, Matt and Greg. We, uh, David, we put this. We've also provided this presentation. Just to let you know, we also provided the same, somewhat same presentation to the wine and grape table grape industry. And so, um, I think you'll see here what we're doing. David will follow up on that. Um, I also appreciate the work of Josh, Juan, and uh, Christina on the nursery board and helping you. In this is Nishika. This is important. It's not just the grape industry, but it's your industry is just as important here, especially in the movement of material. So with that, maybe you can start, David. Sure, great. Uh, my name is David Pagos. I'm with the California Department of Food and Agriculture. Thanks for joining us. We'll try to go through this pretty quickly this morning. Uh, next slide. There are a number of staff on from CDFA, and as Mark alluded to, uh, we want to give them a thank you. Uh, Dr. Kyle Berkey is also going to be tag teaming with me, with me on this as well as uh, Colleen Murphy. So, so uh, as alluded to, the uh, spotted lanternfly is a large, uh, large in size, lays its eggs on a flat surface like uh, truck, uh, you know, trucks, sides of trucks, um, rail cars, that type of stuff. So that's one of our, our main concerns of movement and then feeding on the tree of heaven or tree of hell, which I love Janet's uh, uh, new, new name for it and the preferred grape in North America. Next slide, please. Dr. Do you want me to interject uh, just briefly? So uh, they already talked about the life cycle, you know, one year life cycle, typically the eggs hatch around April, um, you get the four nymphal instars, the adults appear in the late summer, and then you have mating and, and egg laying starts uh, in the fall. 
And just in terms of the host range, we've got over 100 species of confirmed hosts, and this is going to, you know, probably grow as the pest spreads. These are just the things that we know that they feed on, um, and those are verified feeding hosts, not just plants that they were found on. And yeah, tree of heaven grapes; those are the preferred hosts for the adults. But uh, some of the other things that they will go after include maples, oaks, um, stone fruits, things like that, willows. Um, and then just in terms of the impact, yeah, great uh, vineyards appear to be the, the industry that has the highest direct impact. And then uh, nurseries, it's mainly the regulatory impact uh, from what I've read. Continue, sorry. Uh, Kyle, you're gonna go over this map? Yeah, sorry. So, so this map uh, reflects the counties that we currently regulate for our exterior quarantine. Um, these are counties where we, we have uh, verified infestations, you know, from some official source, you know, we're not using things like news articles and things like that. Um, and, and so the, both the blue and the red here indicate infestations and those counties are covered by our quarantine. We didn't know about the Indiana one, so we'll have to check on that. So yeah, I currently we're aware of uh, nine states with infestations. No federal quarantine, as, as you, I'm sure you already know, uh, six states, um, at least the last time I checked, had interior quarantines. We've been uh, looking for spotted lantern fly, uh, both with, uh, within state high risk surveys, as well as uh, when we're doing Japanese beetle um, inspections of cargo planes entering California. Um, let's, let me move this stupid bar thing. All right, so uh, yeah, in 2019, we started doing the uh, aircraft inspections. We found 10 adults um, on cargo flights. Then that went up to 44 in 2020, including two live spotted lanternfly. And then uh, the last time, you know, I, I checked uh, this year, we, we had found nine adults. I, I think we found one live so far. Uh, this is probably a little bit higher now. And, and then at the border stations, uh, we did find a non-viable egg mass and a dead adult, and then some dead nymphs. So three interceptions in total, and that was all in 2021. Next slide. Okay, and this is the uh, max and niche modeling uh, study that I was talking about before, um, Wakey et al. I think it's 2021, I can't see that, but, but yeah, you can see based on the occurrence data that they have, uh, so the Northeastern United States as well as Asia, uh, where it's native to and also introduced in Korea, uh, based on the currently known distribution, uh, this is what they predicted using the bioclimatic variables. So you can see that Central Valley of California, coastal uh, California were, uh, had a high likelihood of suitability and, and then, you know, we have the northeastern distribution. And, and then the caveat I mentioned before still stands that this thing is still spreading. So we don't really know. We have no reason really to expect uh, that that areas that are not shown with high suitability may not actually be suitable. It's just that based on where we know it occurs now, this is the picture that it's giving us. Next. Thank you. And this is a short video that you're going to see here just of uh, uh, um, when they're flying in mass. So you can kind of get a glimpse of what these look like. And this is a, a quick one. We just want to kind of show you. I don't know if you can see those. See, they're flying right above there. This is from our, our colleagues in Pennsylvania. And so they've been, been working really closely with them. And you can just see the high numbers when they're swarming. And so that's a, a great concern for us out here with our vineyards, of course. Uh, next. Slide, please. And so the impacts to grapes are our major concern here in California, as, as everyone on this call is aware. We have, of course, wine grapes, but we also have table grapes and uh, raisins. And so the impacts uh, are mainly on the mass feeding that kills the vines and the honeydew and sooty mold, the secondary infection uh, also causes problem. It reduces freeze tolerance and failed fruit set. And we just wanted to highlight this from the secretary of Pennsylvania's Department of Agriculture. We have vineyards in Pennsylvania that after two years are dead. They're done, kills the plant, you're out of that business. And so you, we all know here in California, we have some vineyards that have 100, 200 year old vines. And so those are of 
concern if, if this pest was to be established. Next slide, please. Uh, their peak feeding near or at harvest time, which complicates uh, the, the issue with these flies or these uh, um, spotted lanternfly trying to eradicate them. Feeding can affect ripening and the sugars of the grape, and then this disrupts the harvest time as well. So you have, uh, you have to spray, you can't immediately harvest, you have to have intervals, so there's some impact there. Next slide. This picture. Uh, next slide, please. In this picture, you can see it almost looks like grapes on the ground, but this is after one of the treatments. These are all the dead spotted lanternfly. The problem with this pest, as you've heard, is that it will move from the tree of heaven or tree of hell into vineyards and then go back, right? And so we have a lot of repairing at tree of heaven in Napa and other regions of California. So we're concerned with that back and forth movement of the pest going from a vineyard into the riparian area and uh, um, completing its life cycle. So uh, most of the Nicotinoids and nicotinoids against the, the um, nymphs and adults, and then repeat treatments are necessary. So increased costs um, for vineyard owners. Next slide. Some of the tools in our toolbox, uh, uh, as well as trying to remove the tree of heaven, is to do manual egg scraping, and then some in the pipeline, some bio with some um, wasps and some fungi that have already been mentioned and then by yeah, and we're and we're like, actually uh, supporting uh, somebody in Riverside doing work on one of these potential uh, parasitoid wasps so that work is underway it's an egg parasitoid next slide please and so we've all heard of the European grapevine moth and and knock on wood we we're successful in eradicating that this pest is much much different than the European grapevine moth. So there's no lure for the pest. There's no mating disruption. It's human uh, dispersal is more similar to the gypsy moth. And we have a lot of regulatory challenges. Uh, research, as you've heard, is, is ramping up, but it's not well studied here in the US. And then, as I alluded to previously, it moves between crops and landscapes. And so that's very, very difficult to, to try to eradicate or, or control some of these pests. Next slide. So what have we done? Uh, Kyle Berkey, Dr. Berkey is our state primary entomologist, gave the, the pest an A rating. Uh, we I, provided I actually, I, to, I didn't uh, rate this thing. That was Jason, that was a previous primary. Oh, okay. <laughs> Jason Leathers, uh, is the primary state entomologist. Now Kevin, or Kyle is our, our current state primary entomologist. So the training, and we also provide training for county regulatory staff through our Pest Prevention University, advisories to county and state staff, uh, You've heard we've already had detections at our border stations and air cargo inspections. You want to, yeah, here you can see a couple of photos here of us doing some um, wood cutting and then um, the air cargo inspection. One more push, Colleen, I think you'll see that um, this is the inside of a plane. And um, when we're doing Japanese beetle uh, inspections, we've come across a spot or lantern fly. That's actually a very tricky uh, maneuver. I did that once and you're, uh, you're basically walking on rollers the whole time and trying to avoid, you know, nasty metal objects so that's not an easy job and you know for that point just at our border station as well right you got a lot of crazy drivers and that type of stuff so both of these occupations are highly highly uh, um, uh, important for our activities and then california participates in the slf uh, federal summit and national meetings as well as uh, um, western and national plant boards next slide Additionally, uh, we've been doing a risk-based survey last year, and then we've already initiated a, a more expanded survey this year, and that is ongoing. It's ongoing. Okay. It should be done by the end of the month or shortly after. And we established the uh, California State Exterior Quarantine, and then, um, you know, as Kyle alluded to, we have research uh, to UC Riverside to do some um, uh, research on biocontrol efforts, as well as working with USDA and Cornell and Penn State to investigate some um, paras parasitoids and path pathogens. And Colleen, if you wanna, um, also we've been working on this interact, we wanna kind of show off Colleen and her team have been doing a great job on this. Mark, you wanna comment on the, the map at all? Sure, um, Colleen put a, a great map together. We've also had meetings with Western Plant Board states, as part of the National Plant Board and these this represents those states. Um, Colleen put on here are the highway infrastructure, of course. And then what you see in blue is the rail infrastructure. <clears throat> uh, UP, the UP uh, system is mainly in the north. BNSF for Burlington Northern is mainly in the south. And we do know that most of these, these trains or the uh, movement of goods 
emanates from Chicago in that area and then comes to, to the West. And then, so we're very focused in that we have had a couple group meetings with Western plant port states, not only on SLF, but Japanese beetle at the same time. So there is a collective Western approach here. Also, uh, Colleen, I believe put on this map, these red areas are uh, the areas of the current SLF survey that uh, Kyle had mentioned. <clears throat> it's roughly triple the size that we did last year. We did about 150 to 200. This is over 500, 600 sites now of the expansion of the uh, survey. And these are visual surveys. I think is the red last year, Colleen, and yellow this year. Is that correct? Maybe so. But you see the expansion of that or the... Yes. Um, okay, thank you. So the yellow is, is this year's proposed. Mm -hmm. And then the red is where we, we uh, explored, uh, did a survey last year. And these are things that, you know, they're based on information like uh, how many uh, how many things were intercepted that were going to coming from eastern states, you know, gypsy moth states, um, you know, so kind of looking at the volume of vehicles or, or trade going to individual locations from possible infested states, right? So one other, one other comment too is for, uh, I like to use this, this fact anyway, is that Roseville, just north of here, in Sacramento, um, is UP's yard, a rail yard, and it's the largest rail yard west of the Mississippi. <clears throat> and so that yard currently is uh, underway of being reduced footprint and then moving that uh, yard or uh, operations to Sparks. They'll still be there, but the, they're trying to expand Sparks, which is still a Western state for us. Um, so that's an interesting approach. We're trying to get a hold of UP. We did have a meeting with Burlington Northern. And then the rail, the other thing is the state rail plan is the most aggressive one in the state's history, especially with SB1 funding that. So, so there's expansion of rail, uh, not only light rail, but passenger rail in California um, to get to larger, more pedestrian friendly approaches, if you will. Um, so the expansion of passenger rail is a big thing and also sharing with the freight. So uh, Caltran Division of Rail, we've been in contact with as they operate Amtrak in California. So maybe go ahead with this. This is showing, uh, maybe you could go, go ahead, David, grape into grape focused uh, areas. Like this is Northern California and Napa, right? Yes, they, yeah, exactly. She overlaid the, the layers there of the different crops. Colleen, you wanna mention what the layers sure. are? Yeah. So we have uh, here in the legend, you can see that we have uh, SLF uh, adult hosts. So that's what the adults want uh, to feed on, on the dark green. And then there's some light green in here. And then inside of that is, are the grapes overlaid. So any other hosts are green. Uh, you can see then that there's the nursery layer that we have, you know, production, retail, uh, landscape. Just to um, interrupt, the, the green, am I correct that the green just represents the uh, crop layers that we have that also happen to be adult hosts? Yes. Yeah, okay, it's so not yeah, all so the crops. It's just crops that are uh, yeah, so it, specific, specific to SLF, yes. So it's not it's not including all of the things in the environment, you know, just so people don't look at this and think, oh, this is these are the areas where they could occur, you know. <laughs> Correct. And then also we have the green dots. As you zoom out, you can see that those are the, the tree of heaven. So uh, Central Valley, this is Lodi. This is a lot of uh, wine grapes, of course. Uh, as you go down, then you also have all the table grapes within the Central Valley. Um, and you can see more of those crops appearing in Central Valley. And then of course, Southern California. So we put a lot of work into this map and Colleen and his team have, have really helped try to be strategic in our placement of traps and using all this data that we have, including our border stations has really helped us and locate some of these trap locations. For brevity's sake, let's move on. We can yep. love your map. It's an awesome map. <laughs> There's a lot of work. And, and next slide, Kyle's gonna go over this one. Yeah, so, uh... Yeah, we can probably just ignore the life cycle thing on the left. I already went over that. The, yeah, yeah, as we all said before, the eggs are the overwintering stage. You've got one generation per year. 
Um, in terms of things that we are doing, uh, we are setting up an ad hoc spotted lanternfly science advisory panel. That's going to happen on uh, September 21st and 22nd, possible follow up uh, meeting on the 23rd. And uh, basically, we're convening a bunch of uh, uh, 10, you know, people who have either, you know, are either experts in spotted lanternfly, many of them from the East Coast who've been doing research, you know, continuously on that pest, and as well as a couple people from California that have, um, you know, different pest uh, experience in the state and may offer perspective on, you know, potential impacts of spotted lanternfly to California agriculture. Uh, so again, 10 people, September 21st to 22nd. Um, it's going to be online. It will be open uh, in, in at least to the public for, you know, portions of it. Uh, we're also developing a California statewide action plan, you know, trying to look at uh, any kind, all aspects of a response, you know, delimitation, detection, um, things like the Q word, uh, eradication, communication. So we're, we're looking at all of those things, um, how we might address um, finding this pest in California. And that, that will also, um, the, the results of the recommendations from the science advisory panel are gonna feed into that and will help guide that. So that's an evolving thing. Next. Thanks, Kyle. And so some additional activities that we're doing, we're working with the CACASA, the California Agricultural Association, Agricultural Commissioners Association. Uh, we're developing a training module with the master gardeners on spotted lanternfly. And then uh, additionally, we'll develop an effect, uh, evaluation of that training model with uh, citizen scientists. So we're trying to get more eyes out there looking for this pest, conduct host specific, specificity testing using spotted lanternfly at our UC Riverside uh, biocontrol facility, biosecurity facility. Uh, develop risk-based maps and modeling to forecast establishment of the spotted lanternfly within California, mapping of crop species at risk to spotted lanternfly infestation in California, and then determine the suitability of especially food and nut crops like avocados, almonds, citrus, uh, olives, et cetera, for host for the spotted lanternfly and evaluate the feeding damage. Next slide. And then as you alluded to, we're working with the USDA and our Pierce's disease. Uh, um, control board here in California to develop some outreach measures. These are uh, some of the outreach um, items that we're working on. Pretty much the idea right now is to find it and report it. And that's really our goal is to have more eyes out there working with the UC Master Gardener Sentinel program, working as I alluded to with the uh, Pierce's disease glass sewing sharpshooter board, developing communication toolkit and advertising campaign, working with iNaturalist and community-based science to get more folks to help us look for this pest and for that matter the spotted land or for the uh, tree of health and then outreach with stakeholders about spotted lanternfly across the state and we're coordinating with other states as mark alluded to uh, not only through the western plant board but also through the western invasive species council next slide so we're sharing data establishing mous for uh, detection activity training for air cargo inspections, field crews, regulatory staff, and citizen scientists in cooperation to harmonize effects for the, uh, um, the quarantines. And just a final note, you know, I've, I've worked with CDFA for about 15 years or so. I've never seen so much proactive uh, um, items or uh, measures taken for a pest. And so I, I think uh, you know, we've laid out a, a good action plan here and, and hopefully knock on wood, it doesn't get out here, but if it does, we are definitely uh, not gonna be caught for flat footing, right? We have a lot of activities going on. And so next next slide, just our questions. So we'll open it up for questions and thanks for letting us go over a little bit today as well on our time. Janet, uh, do you wanna open up for questions or are there any questions yeah, for us? I, anyone have questions for CDFA or USDA? I'm sure they're still on the line. Yeah, this, this is Bruce Jensen with Driscoll's. <clears throat> um, so vineyards and, and fruit trees uh, seem to be the main hosts. Um, would that also include the, uh, the commercial fruit uh, uh, for, for rubus and, and such, or have we seen any, any signs? You know, I'd, I'd have to go back and look at the host list, but 
Um, you know, Colleen might know because I know that I filtered that list for crops and I think I would have noted Rubus. So I'm not sure if she remembers that, but I would have to go back and look. I mean, I'll say that in general, these uh, spotted lanternfly are going after trees, um, not, you know, but Rubus is more of kind of a woody. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I would ha have to go back and look, uh, unless Colleen can remember. I, I, oh, Greg I could do wait not remember, but I know that there's a list and, and yeah, I'm not sure. Let me, let me I, I, right now I'm going to go back and look and I'll, I'll do it as fast as I can. Uh, Kyle, this is Andy. Rubus is on the host list. It is. Okay, so forget <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, well. and say in the experience out east, this is great again. But yeah, it's been primarily um, right the the uh, forest uh, tree hosts, and then of course grapes like the wild grapes and cultivated grapes. But uh, for the uh, fruit trees, you know, it, 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 although it had shown up on that uh, one occasion in high numbers, we really have not seen it on the fruit trees. And so I know Penn State is even you know. Um, restating some of what they say about um, about fruit trees. In terms and is that, of like, are you including apples? Are you including yeah. apples in that? Okay. Yeah. And then as far as, um, yeah, I mean, we have seen it on, or it has been observed on blackberries and of course on uh, rubus on the canes. And a lot of that's the nymphal stage, not so much the, the adults on those. Just a, you know. And then sometimes it's just like, they just happen to be in, numbers close by and they get on it and they can feed and they, they like it. So they'll stay there for a while, but not uh, to the point where people are seeing anything significant at this point. All right, the same thing with vegetable transplants. They've been observed a lot on some vegetable transplants as early nymphs because they really like that herbaceous succulent tissue and then they move off. It. And that, and you know, this kind of leads into someone was asking about the San Joaquin Valley and the climate in California and you know, some of this may, you know, I wonder how much of the preferred, you know, the preference might change in a different climate. So, you know, maybe, maybe if there's hosts like tree of heaven available out east, you know, they're going to go to that. And then if they're in a dry situation, maybe we don't, maybe we'd be surprised with, uh, you know, they might be showing up in high numbers on any tree that is watered. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and that's definitely been a question too, because I've really had like a, a good drought situation out east where they're at yet, because that's always been the question is like, what would they do if there was a drought situation out there to see how they would behave or react? Any other questions? Oh, uh, yeah, Chris and I mean, I just, not so much a question, but more of a comment and just, thinking um, into the future. So if, if SLF ends up here in California, you know, often the nursery industry is usually the first line of, of uh, defense and takes the brunt of these uh, quarantine measures. And so I want to ask the, the CDFA team, how can we proactively work together to try and avoid any disruption in nursery shipments and uh, make sure we put forth a program that is uh, beneficial and successful for all parties. I'm just going to jump in, just briefly mention that the first thing would be uh, making sure you're following the state exterior quarantine <laughs> and those requirements. And then if you see anything, tell someone. And Josh Grass is on as well and can address that. I am. And I'm going to go ahead and leave my camera off. I've been having some reception issues today, so hopefully you can, all can hear me okay. Um, so I, I think it's been clear from the presentation thus far, there's still a lot that's unknown about this pest and the mitigations that are gonna be necessary. But as was mentioned, we are doing a lot of proactive work around uh, spotted lantern fly and trying to determine what it's gonna look like when it does, uh, when we do have a find in California. And I know that was one of the outstanding questions. So, I mean, and I know you all are aware that for any quarantine, when a pest is found, we place a hold, sign compliance agreements, and put into place mitigations to make sure that plant material can be moved safely um, or any host commodity can be moved safely. Um, with SLF, those documents are, we, we do have staff that are developing those, and I, I do want to, you know, give a quick shout out to Kyle and, and Nawal Sharma as well on their work and starting to put together drafts of a quarantine action plan, uh, draft compliance agreements, quarantine languages, or quarantine language, 
and starting to put, put together, um, start to investigate treatments and other mitigations that would be possible. Um, we've been fortunate to have good working relationships, not only with USDA who's been on the call today, but also with the states that are currently dealing with that. Um, a lot, unfortunately, a lot of that is still unknown. And as Kyle was mentioned, we do have the science advisory panel coming up. Um, we certainly do recommend uh, logging into that because a lot of the answers to some of those questions will be coming up via the science advisory panel. Um, so answers like what will it, what will the area under quarantine actually be? Um, what mitigations will be able to be put into place? What uh, treatments are available that would be applicable to nursery stock? And including things like what what uh, you know what, is nursery stock a viable pathway for the movement of SLF? And if so, is that specific to certain plants, certain life stages, et cetera? Some of that information is still to be determined. So it's difficult to do a whole lot of um, collaborative efforts at this point, other than making sure that the industry is aware of this situation um, and aware of any information that is currently available. Um, we will continue to do outreach such as this uh, and continue to work with you, Chris, and others to try to make sure that the, the potentially affected industries are going to be aware of, of the potential impacts of this very serious pest. Um, you know, as, as you alluded, as you mentioned, Nursery stock is normally the, the number one highest risk pathway and therefore the, the number one regulated commodity anytime we have a quarantine. Um, this one is a little bit different in that, you know, when so far, especially with regards to our exterior quarantine, the highest risk pathway is actually outdoor, outdoor articles um, and the laying of egg messes on those outdoor articles like the gypsy moth. Um, but that these are things that are still under investigation. So I think we're going to get answers to some of those questions via the science advisory panel. Um, Kyle, I don't know if you have anything else to add or mark along those lines, but I would, I think yeah. it really it's, it's a matter of, you know, participating in that, getting the answers from that, but then again, engaging in outreach. And as we start to get those answers, figuring out um, common sense solutions to, to some of those mitigations to make sure that we can actually accommodate those and implement those in California. The only thing I would say is that we would, to your point, Chris, we would commit to, <clears throat> after the science advisory panel, I think it's the following week, I think it's next week, if it's the 17th already, is that we would commit to sharing the approach with you as we go forward as we're developing, developing it so that you under, you can see and understand how we're trying to approach what Josh just mentioned, the quarantines and how we can um, be practical, if you will, to your point. We well, should share, share the approach with you. Potentially training um, for nursery uh, staff would be helpful so you can help identify this best because that's kind of where we're at right now, right, is on the lookout for this. So I know we're working with UC Master Gardeners on a training module and perhaps we can utilize that for training for nursery staff so that they can help uh, have more eyes out there as well, if that would help Chris. Yeah, David, we can talk about also including it in our uh, certified nursery professional uh, program as well. Um, I know we've talked about some other uh, venues to get to certain individuals out there in the industry. Um, so thank you for all the answers. And I, I want to commend uh, Mark and the team at CDFA for getting well ahead of this issue. Again, I don't think we've ever seen this kind of approach. And I think it's, uh, it's a great maneuver and uh, being prepared for what might happen. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? There, there was a question in the in the question pane. Um, could the training materials for master gardeners be shared uh, to train nursery folks? Yes, yes. In fact, we're meeting with Missy Gable soon to go over their initial um, products, and so yes, that's a. a of course, the path that we want to take, right, is getting more eyes out there, uh, not only with the master gardeners and citizen scientists, but of course, industry staff, as well as well as our agricultural commissioners and their staff. So that's the, the kind of goal right now is to get more eyes out there looking for it. California is a big state. Um, and additionally, working with urban forest folks, right, some cities are starting to map their um, tree populations. So tree of heaven is one that we could potentially identify and try to figure out you know, where it's located within different cities as well. So there's a number of steps, but I think training right now is going to be the best first step to make. The only other thing is that, you know, we, we have, we have strong relationships with Helene, Beth, Aaron, and her team, of course, Matt, and participating with them because of the federal partnership that we have with them. 
And they're very uh, gracious in their time and strategy in helping us address it before it gets here. <clears throat> I know they're fighting a big battle back east, but at the same time, uh, they're trying to help us strategically look ahead, which is a good opportunity for us. Very much so. And that collaboration started with our border protection staff, where we sent them out from mm -hmm. California to Pennsylvania to see this best firsthand. And so that was one of those collaborations, right, so that we can get our folks being able to train. What do these egg masses look like? And those types of steps. So it's been a great collab. Hey, this is uh, Greg again. I'm sorry, Dan. I just want to add a few things to what I answered to Kyle. Just so I'm clear on the the tree fruit side, like because I always forget to add my caveats in these meetings. But the, uh, but of course, that just has to do with what SLS has been exposed to in Pennsylvania. So we don't know the varieties, of course. And then they definitely seem like they like to feed in the lenticels on the apple trees. But then there's other things you have to consider too, like if they're in their feeding, you're getting honeydew on the apples. So the normal washing process seems to get rid of that. But then, you know, egg masses on the, you know, what the bins out in the field potentially. But then uh, also there's some studies going on this year to see what they might do if they fed on a young planting, because that's not what, what's clear yet either. If they came in, say, to a young planting, would they like feed on it heavy enough that it would really impact it? Thanks. Uh, one more question. Would those slideshows be available to the uh, board by chance? Slide, so these presentations today? Correct. I, I believe so, Aaron. Um, and yeah, I, I can, you can share it. Um, there's nothing in there that is, you know, totally public. Um, so um, just the caveat that I forgot to change eight to 10. Sorry about that. Um, my bad but yeah yeah, and this is, yeah and same with us you know this is a public meeting we're happy to share information that's what we're trying to do is push information out so of course um, we'll get this to Juan and uh, he can send them out to the group much appreciated thank you well, yeah glad and we'll gladly come back and provide updates as you as you think so Janet or okay. however you'd like to approach in the future great yeah, we'll certainly will be wanting updates to the nursery advisory board. Any final questions or comments? Janet, we can post the uh, the presentations on the nursery website, and uh, we okay. can send all the uh, the persons or the people right. participating in the meeting. Thank you. Sounds good. And Mark, thank you for sharing that information, those papers that you were talking about to Chris and other people who are interested in it. I'm um, looking forward to being able to give input on the practicality of some of these protocols that may be mm -hmm. uh, developed and work together with CDFA and USDA as we go along with this. Sure thing. With no more questions or comments, I want to thank the presenters. This was a wonderful um, presentation on this today. It really was very informative. I want to thank the uh, Nursery Advisory Board and all of our guests. Um, are there any additional public comments? <laughs> if not, we will adjourn the meeting at 930. And thank you all very much. Thank you very much. Thanks, thank Janet. you. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you.